what? what? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm in a weird mood. Okay. I uh, think you know how I tell you normally, you know, like, you know, no, like, no, uh, nah, not really. Like, we got an interesting show for you guys. I got a lot of na 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 na. What did I tell you? I got a little bit of good news. Uh, we have the Iran, Iran, Iranian protests, and that's why I started with the. Uh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> but it doesn't make no kind of sense. <laughs> I'm on the Iranian side. Well, actually, in both cases, as you're about to see, because Iran's in the news for two major things. Uh, but I also I liked it because it was a contrast to, again, JR's smooth entry. I wanted to rough it up a little bit. Um, okay, so let's start with Iran. And then I'm going to get to how stupid the Republicans are, as we usually do, and then how weak and pathetic the Democrats are. It's a very predictable show. You know how it goes. <laughs> I wish they'd change it up on us. But not my fault. All, you know, all I do is the reporting. Okay, I don't create the news. All right, so Iran, uh, two major pieces of news. One, uh, they've come out and said, yes, we're enriching, enriching uranium, uh, and we're kicking ass, and it's 20% uh, purity, and that's good enough to create energy. And then uh, Ahmadinejad added, <laughs> although I believe it's more Arabic than Persian. But anyway, um, so they came out, and they're like, yeah, what are you going to do about it, huh? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, uranium. What are you going to do? And I believe our answer is not much. <laughs> okay. Now, we're kind of hamstrung. What are you going to do? Uh, bomb them? Because they got 20% purity. They need 80% purity for nuclear weapons. Uh, Gibbsy comes out and uh, during the press conference, of course, the White House, and he says, I don't even really believe them. I don't even think that they have that much, uh, you know, uh, uranium enrichment. Uh, I think they're full of it. Uh, their scientists are weak sauce, uh, and they can't really bring it. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to take some sort of action, and we're going to. The Treasury Department has already begun to shut down some of the bank accounts of the Revolutionary Guard in uh, America. Which, of course, always whenever I see that story, I think, really, the Revolutionary Guard of Iran have bank accounts in America? Why? <laughs> like, first of all. Uh, do they not realize that at the first sign of trouble we would freeze those accounts? I've read like 12 articles on that. <laughs> Have they not read any of those articles? It's really weird, right? And, and of course, I love our Wall Street bankers, right? They're like, uh, Iranian money? Sure, who gives you? Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. As long as we can make money over it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, who cares, right? So, um, now, look, here's my controversial opinion on this. Are you guys ready for controversy? Oh, don't make me play. Don't make me do it. Controversy, but with a Muslim twist. Okay, all right, please. Um, here's the situation. <laughs> uh, they have all the right in the world to develop nuclear energy. There, I said it. Okay, conservatives, go ahead. Go crazy, okay? Whatever you want to do. I know, I know, you're on. Okay, I got you, okay? Can you tell I'm in the mood to play that today? <laughs> All right. So, um, their argument is this. We, America develops nuclear energy. The West develops nuclear energy. China develops nuclear energy. Hell, you guys all have nuclear weapons. Uh, my biggest enemy in the area is Israel. They have nuclear weapons. So why can't I develop nuclear energy? Go ahead. Yeah? Okay, I got one more for you. The answer is... You got nothing. You can't. Of course uh, they can develop nuclear energy, rationally speaking, logically speaking. Now, do we want them to? No. I, I don't like the go government of Ahmadinejad. I, first of all, it's a total fraud. The Iranian people did not vote for that. It's a fundamentalist government. It's ridiculous. And uh, I can't stand it in 18 different ways. But what difference does that make? <laughs> so will we tell Iran, yeah, you know, we don't really like your leader, so we're going to be irrational and say, even though we can all develop nuclear energy, you can't. Why? I challenge anyone to come up with a rational argument why the Iranian government, uh, the Iranian people, don't have a right to develop their own nuclear energy. And by the way, the international law is completely on their side. Now, what are we concerned about? Uh, we're concerned that they're going to make nuclear weapons. Do I want the Iranian government to have nuclear weapons? Hell no. Not even close. That being said, there's not even a great argument to be made as to why they can't have nuclear weapons. 
Now, we think it would disturb, uh, you know, world peace, etc. If it was up to me, I would. No new country would be able to get nuclear weapons, and we would get rid of a lot of the nuclear weapons we have now, because uh, you know they're not doing anybody any good, and they're a menace to the world. And Ahmadinejad's a little off his rocker, not you know not as much as the right wing in this country say. He's a calculating guy, but he's calculating in, in a direction I don't like. I don't like the guy. Okay, I don't like his policies. Uh, I don't like his government, etc. Right? But again, why does Israel get to have nuclear weapons? And America, who says that we need regime change, but uh, in, in Iran, but Iran doesn't get to have nuclear weapons. Who made those rules? Oh, you'll be shocked to find out. America made those rules. <laughs> well, isn't that convenient? Your enemies don't get to have weapons, and you do. Yeah, I like that system. I'm part of America, so yeah, rah rah us. But it's not really that logical. So we don't have a great argument. Now Iran says, and Ahmadinejad came out today and said, look. If I wanted to make weapons, I just tell you I'm making weapons. We're not making nuclear weapons. Now, I don't really trust Ahmadinejad. On the other hand, he's 20% right on that because he's not like he's a shy guy. <laughs> at some point, he's going to come out. Probably, it's just they're not ready yet, right? But at some point, uh, if he wants to make weapons, he'll turn around and say, "Go, yeah, yeah. Now I'm making nuclear weapons. What are you going to do about it?" And the reality is, we have no good options. I mean, the maniacs on our right wing say attack. Right? Yeah, great. Start another war in the Middle East. That's insanity. Okay, no, we're not going to do that, right? And on the other hand, can we do sanctions? Yeah, we're not really in the right. But if they go towards nuclear weapons, yes, then I'm in favor of sanctions, and I hope everybody rallies around that because it's it just destabilizes the area. It destabilizes the world, right? Uh, even though we don't have a good case to make. <laughs> okay, but on the nuclear energy stuff, they're just too right. As much as I don't like them, yeah, and it is what it is. I hate to do it to you. I hate to do it to us. I'm the most uh, open-minded man in America. I'm the most reasonable guy in the world. How do I know? I, I said it. So I, I rule in favor of Iran. Yeah, oh, go ahead, conservatives, go nuts. Heads exploding all over the country. That lib! I told you it was for Iran. <laughs> okay. By the way, speaking of which, we have a great hate mail that came in today. I'm gonna save that for the post game because I'm a bad man, and I need you to be a member to uh, read that, so I can read that hate mail to you. God, I love the hate mail. I, I mean, I, to all the people who send a nice message, I love you guys, and I really appreciate. It. it Picks me up every day. Don't get me wrong, but I can't get enough of the hate mail. It's you know, I'm a turkey. I'm this. I'm that. But he's got great insults. So that's in the post game. All right. Now the second part of the Iran story is, uh, meanwhile, the uh, people of Iran are protesting because the election was absolutely stolen from them, and. Uh, and by the way, the power behind that is the Revolutionary Guard, and they're the ones that said, "Nah, we like Ahmadinejad where he is. He's our boy." Uh, so he lost the election. Who cares? We'll pretend he won it by a large margin. And when the people protest, we'll just, you know, kick their ass. And that's what's happened, and that continues to happen today. They came out for another, uh, you know, protest. There you see uh, all of the government troops. Uh, Gathering to intimidate the protesters, and apparently it worked. Apparently they did intimidate them. Uh, they did a couple of different things. First of all, they beat down people with batons and tear gas, and uh, they had such overwhelming numbers. And uh, apparently they beat them with cables. That's that's unnecessary. And here's a poor guy getting beat down. Um, and uh, they've unfortunately taken off his shirt for no reason, and almost seeing his ass, which is also unfortunate. But I think the beat down's more unfortunate. So. Uh, now, you know they're shutting down Twitter and Facebook and uh, and uh, all those things in in Iran, so it makes it harder for the protests to get together. Uh, and apparently, a lot of the protesters were disappointed at the turnout. And this is the Iranian government slowly crushing the movement. And I tell you, first of all, I have tremendous respect for those Iranian protesters. In the face of almost certain beatings, and you know, one of the things that the Iranian police are doing, they're shooting. Paintballs at the protesters, so they can mark them. So then they go find them later with the paint on them. Okay, if they can, if they can catch them, they don't run home, etc. And then they drag them off and do God knows what with them. So I mean, those people have enormous courage. But how long can they stay out there? How long can they come out there and get met with this overwhelming force? So you know, today, by most accounts, not all accounts, but most accounts, a little disappointing in the protests. By the way, another disappointing piece of news is 
Mir Hussein Musabi's wife, of course, he was the one that actually won the election, although they said uh, Ahmadinejad won. His wife, uh, Zara Ranobard, uh, was apparently beaten during the protest. Now, they got her out of there, and, uh, and so they, apparently they saved her from grave harm, uh, but she was beaten by the authorities in one of the protests. So it, it's a mess over there, and as I look at it, I mean, it's what I thought was going to happen is, is slowly happening, which is that the more time you go from the election, the more time power has a chance to establish itself and the more uh, opportunity it has to crush all opponents. And that's why I continue to be surprised every time there's a large protest. I can't believe how courageous those people are and how they persist in this. Uh, and look, again, we talked about the end game during the election, and here we are again with the end game. I don't know what scares the Revolutionary Guard, Ahmadinejad, and, and the mullahs to say, okay, no mas, you win, we lose. I don't think street protests do it. I think they're like, oh, you're going around and around. Yeah, that's nice. Well, what do I care, right? That doesn't really affect my power, right? In the end, in order to have a real revolution, I th now it's, this sucks, right? And these guys have been wonderfully nonviolent. But in the end, I think you've got to drag the people out into the street. I mean, if you don't grab a couple of the leaders and actually take them out, how are they? They're not ever going to give in. And I, I could be wrong about that, and I hope I'm wrong about that. And I'm not saying they should do that, because that's a hell of a lot of risk, and I don't want to encourage violence, etc. But I don't see how the end game plays out otherwise. So, you know, I, I wish these protesters a tremendous amount of luck. And, and like I said now, three times over, I, I couldn't respect them any more than I do. Uh, it's a tough battle that they're fighting. And one quick note to tie the two stories together. You know, if Mousavi was, you know, was allowed to become uh, the leader of Iran, which he actually, of course, won, like I said, uh, I don't think he would change their uranium enrichment program. Uh, that's the indication that we get from Iran, because he says the same thing Ahmadinejad says. Well, why don't I get nuclear energy when the rest of all of you do? And again, it's a point that's too good to deny, and I think that it's backed by the Iranian people, who say, yeah, of course we should have the right to develop nuclear energy just like everybody else does. So, uh, so I don't think that that change in government would necessarily help that issue immediately. It might certainly help in having them not develop it into weapons, and it would help in, in many other ways. But, but understand that uh, phenomenon, okay? All right, so now uh, let's go kick some Republican ass. These idiots uh, are for real. I, I thought they were kidding around. Now I've seen like 20 different clips where they're like, oh, big snowstorm in the East Coast. What happened to global warming? It doesn't seem very warm out there now. I'm like, hey, come on, you please, please don't tell me that you're this dumb. But of course they are. And they, what's more important is they think that their audience is really dumb. And they think, well, this is going to be easy to trick them on this issue. Snow? Not warm. Ha <laughs> Too easy. Now, of course, let's start with the basics. There's a difference between weather and climate for people who don't understand. Weather is something that happens in a, in a very small period of time. Like today, the weather is cloudy, right? Climate is something that ho happens over a large period of time. The climate uh, of the Earth in a year, in the last 10 years, etc. For example, in the last 10 years, we had the warmest decade in recorded history. So the fact that we had the warmest <laughs> decade in recorded history is not negated by one snowstorm in the middle of February on the East Coast. <laughs> and understand that the climate change at this point is fairly small. It's a little over one degree difference. Now, if it gets to four degrees, that's an enormous difference and will cause tremendous uh, fluctuation in weather patterns and will have enormous consequences throughout the world, ice caps melting, et cetera, et cetera. But a little over uh, one degree is what we have now in, in terms of change, in terms of it getting warmer. Now, so on a given day in Washington, when let's say it would be 24 degrees outside, even if uh, <laughs> climate change applied to every single day, right, which it doesn't because the weather fluctuates all the time throughout the seasons, throughout the year, et cetera, I'm telling the most obvious things, but apparently people don't get it, right? you got to tell it in a simple way to the Republicans. So even if it, it applied every single day, instead of being 24 degrees, it'd be 25 degrees. And you'd still get snow. 
You see what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. It doesn't mean because you have global warming that it's never going to snow anywhere anymore. And it's not a 20 degree difference, it's not a 30 degree difference. If it was, we would already be in more trouble than you could imagine, right? So these are the reasons why you could still have a snowstorm. Now, some people make the argument that global warming or climate change actually makes the uh, snowstorms even more extreme. You know, I I'm not sure I'm 100% sold on that, but they do have a good case. One of the things is that it's not that it makes the weather colder and hence the snow uh, storm bigger. No, it increases. Actually, ironically, by the weather being slightly warmer, it increases the precipitation in the air so that when it does snow, it snows more. So that's interesting. And, you know, it hasn't happened in the Great Lakes area yet, but it's actually apparently more likely to happen in that area because you have the n slightly uh, warmer weather, plus that causes the ice to melt from the Great Lakes, and that causes even more precipitation leading to storms that are larger where you get more snow, right? So uh, that's a good and interesting case to be made for that. Uh, it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that any particular snowstorm is going to be larger than another, right? Because it depends on the day, the season, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I just wanted to make the obvious point that because there's a snowstorm in Washington doesn't mean that their global warming isn't true. And the Fox guys are going ballistic, man. Every one of them had it either. They're strutting. They're like, ah. they think they have a good point. They're like, oh, yeah, they want to have a snowstorm. <laughs> Lips, Al Gore. <laughs> you're like, God, man, you are just so pathetic. For people who know anything, they look so painfully dumb. But the Fox News audience is like, oh, man, zinger. Hannity got him. <laughs> It just makes me feel kind of sad and amused for them at the same time. <laughs> you, you serve to amuse me. All right. Uh, do I have time for a Sarah Palin thing? i like to start with Sarah Palin. No, I don't. Okay, I'm going to save uh, an embarrassing story about Sarah Palin. I, I, I got one every day. You want more? I'll give you more. Okay. Uh, for a little bit later in the program. All right, young turns. I am your host, Jake Huger. J.R. Jackson's producer. And Jesus could always direct it. Everybody's looking to have fun this hour. And I believe we're going to deliver on that promise. In the last segment, we're going to do a really interesting interview where we're going to sh sh shred David Broder of the Washington Post. Uh, he is the epitome of establishment Washington. God, I hope he's listening on his XM set. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know if he's a member at theyoungturks.com, but if he's listening on his XM, David, hang in there. Hang in there for the third hour because we're coming for you. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to rip uh, Boehner and Cantor in the beginning. Oh, they're such crybabies. But first, since I'm in a ripping mood, let's start with Sarah Palin. <laughs> I love when the conservatives cry, oh, you're hitting her too hard. Come on, be fair. Why are you grabbing her? In fact, we have one of the conservatives online. What, what do you think we, uh, we should do with Sarah Palin? <laughs> Leave her alone. <laughs> well, it turns out uh, us pointing out to the American people uh, what a disaster Sarah Palin is, and how little she knows has pretty much worked. Uh, Washington Post, ABC News poll saying that 71% of Americans do not feel that Palin is qualified to be president. Oh, elbow from the sky. That's pretty much over right there. 71% is a huge number. Huge. So if 71% of the country doesn't think you're qualified to be president, wrap it up. Go home. Go home. Yeah, we're going to leave you alone real soon. Because then, it, it, with these kind of numbers, you are actually becoming irrelevant. Uh, the numbers continue to be uh, disastrous for her. Um, in the, by the way, uh, last year, uh, I'm sorry, when she was running for president, 66% thought that she was qualified. So they have dropped precipitously since then, okay? Um, yeah, uh, among Republicans, I should say. Now only 45% of Republicans think she's qualified. So even Republicans, the majority, don't think so. Oh, it's a disaster for her, okay? And her overall favorability is 37%, and her unfavorable view is 55%, so uh, much more unfavorable. That being said, it like that number of favorability compared to the people who think she's qualified overall in the population is so close, there's some chance that some people think that she's totally unqualified to be president, but they like her anyway. So... Those are an interesting group of people I was going to say that I'd like to meet, but I'm not sure that's really true. So, uh, Sarah, you might get your wish uh, soon enough, 
if these numbers continue, you will be so ir irrelevant that we will, in fact, leave you alone. All right. Now, uh, we move on to uh, an, another interesting part of that poll that I can't, you know, uh, leave this story without uh, pointing out. Again, Washington Post, ABC News, uh, they did a poll. Nearly two-thirds of those polls say they know just some, very little or nothing about what the Tea Party movement stands for. So because you're seeing a lot of polls now where the Tea Party movement is beating the Republican Party and is beating the Democratic Party. When they have a, you know, put those three in a poll, uh, at least one prominent poll had the Tea Party winning. And I thought, that doesn't make any kind of sense. These Tea Party guys are, you know, are fairly fringe, right? I mean, they're angry, and, and I get they're angry, and, and we reached out to them in some ways because they're not so wrong about feeling uh, anger about the establishment, et cetera, but they've been wildly misdirected. So I was surprised at those high numbers. Well, it turns out it's because two-thirds of people have no idea what they stand for. If they did, then they might not like them as much. Uh, quick follow-up to that. One in eight say that they know a great deal about the positions of the uh, Tea, Party, Tea Party groups. Uh, but 45% of all Americans say they agree with at least somewhat with the Tea Parties on issues, including a majority of Republicans and Independents. So 45% saying, I like the Tea Party, but two-thirds saying, I have no idea what they stand for, even though I like them, <laughs> okay, even though some portion of that 66% really like them. So don't, don't get, I thought that was very, very instructive, because don't get too carried away with how popular Tea Party people are. Uh, a great majority of the country have no idea what they stand for at all. Okay. So now let's go kick some uh, Republican ass. I'm going to start with uh, that crybaby uh, John Boehner. Oh, man, he's so scared to go to that health care summit. I mean, he's going to try to find 800 different ways to get out of it. Uh, now, they're not going to let him out because now even Bill Crystal and Carl Rove are saying they should go. Otherwise, they're going to look scared. But look at him trying to squirm out of it. Let's start with clip number one. He's on with Greta Van Susteren of Fox News. The president made very plain that February 25th, when he's gathering this, uh, the bipartisan group, um, we'll get to whether or not anyone's going to show up, but he said that he's, he wants to start with the existing bills. Is that a non-starter for you? I just don't know how productive it would be. You know, we've asked the president all year uh, to scrap this big government takeover bill. Uh, let's start with a clean sheet of paper. Let's find out where we've got common ground. And let's try to do the common sense, step-by-step -step approach to making our current system work better. Everyone knows that our health care system needs help. Uh, but I do think there are half a dozen things we can agree on. So why don't we take this step-by-step -step approach? Uh, but I think starting with a bill that the Democrat majority in the House and Senate can't pass is the wrong place to start the conversation. <laughs> well, look... Uh... I like that little thing that he did where he rubbed it in the Democrats' face. He's like, you can't even get your butt boys to vote with you, right? It's true, because those guys are with corporate America, too. They're sellouts just like the Republicans. So he's like, ha-ha, you got as many sellouts as we do. Say, so, well, that whole thing about Spiel about, oh, let's start from scratch. <laughs> let's take the step-by-step. What the hell have we been doing the last year? It's so step-by-step, -step, it's painful to look at. No, they just, of course, want to delay it so they can kill it. Everybody knows this shtick. But now... In the second clip, we're going to begin to get uh, John Boehner a little scared of going to that summit and facing off against Obama. Let's watch. February 25th, um, do you intend to go to this bipartisan meeting that the president's calling and it's going to have televised at the White House? Well, listen, I want to have a bipartisan conversation with the president sure about how to fix our health care system. Obviously. But Eric Cantor and I sent a letter to Rahm Emanuel posing a series of questions about really what is this? You know, the White House let us know about an hour uh, before the American people saw this in his interview on Sunday afternoon. So it's a and, stunt? Well, I don't know. That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. Um, what would it take for you to go to that February 25th? I want to have this bipartisan conversation, oh, of but I want it to be productive, and I want it to be real. Uh, I don't want to walk into some, some trap. I don't want to walk into some political event. Uh, I want to walk in and have a real conversation about what we can do to make this, our current system work better. Okay, so do you ha if the president says, we're starting with this bill, I'm the president, I get to make those decisions, it's my meeting, uh, but we're starting with the bill, we're not going to scrap it, are you going to go? Well, we'll see. Uh, we'd like to go. We'd like to have this conversation. 
Uh, but I want to do everything I can to make it as productive as possible. What do you make of the fact that it's televised? American people are probably delighted that we're getting this televised. I think that's fine, but, you know, is this a, a political event or is this going to be a real conversation? Well, except that we've been hammering them about the transparency. The president know. said, you know, he's going to put everything on C-SPAN, so we can't criticize him now for when he finally does oh, put no, it on C-SPAN. But I want to make sure that we're going to have an honest conversation, you know, an honest bipartisan conversation about how we can approach this. Uh, I don't want to walk into uh, to some setup. I don't know who's going to be there. I don't know how big the room's going to be. I don't know how, uh, what the setup's going to be. And so uh, on behalf of the American people, uh, we've asked the White House, just scrap this bill. Let's, let's start over. Uh, I think that's where most Americans uh, are on this bill. Uh, but I just want to continue to push the White House uh, to, to do this. Let's listen to the American people. Oh, that was awesome. I mean, how scared was he? I mean, he's like sweat dripping off him, right? And he's like, yeah, Mr. I'm going to come to get you. I just don't know how the setup is for the gunfight. I, I, I don't know where, you know, uh, when are you going to draw and what kind of pistol are you going to bring? I, no, please, please don't stop slapping me. Okay. Man, I, I don't want to walk into the trap. <laughs> I, can't, can't, well, I just want it to be productive. Why don't we just scrap this whole thing? Why don't you just agree to everything I say and concede and get rid of your whole bill and do my bill instead, which does nothing? Yeah, I don't think that's how it's going to go, John. Now, John, you're going to man up and you're going to come and uh, uh, d debate the president or talk to the president, or you're going to be, you know, scared about it. I'm being polite here, right? Be like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen, Greta. I'm so scared. <laughs> well, for, go in there and find out. You a man or you're not a man? What you gonna do? Watch, he continues. This is great stuff, man. Clip number three. Well, let's play it out, though. He says he's not going to. He says he's not going to scrap it. He, he says it's his meeting. It's going to be televised, and so the Republican leadership needs to make a decision. Do we go or do we not go? Do we go hoping that he's going to scrap it and start over, that we can convince him? If we don't go, he's going to have cameras there, and he's going to be sitting there with among all the Democrats and say, "We're the Republicans." Those okay. obstructionists. It's the President of the United States. You know, when he pr offers an invitation uh, to go to the White House, you know, uh, naturally you want to go. I'm just trying to make sure that this is as productive and honest a conversation as possible. So what are you going to do to do that? Because we, we know what he's got in mind. Find out where, what the starting point is. He Wanna said the out? starting point oh, is I, with the existing we, we, bill. We asked the question, are Democrats who opposed uh, this, this health care bill, are they going to be invited? Yeah. Uh, are the lobbyists who were involved in putting it together, are they going to be there? Why, you want your buddies uh, there? There are a number of questions that I'd like to have answered before I give you or the president a straight up or down answer. No idea how many people are invited to this. I have no idea. No idea. No. <laughs> so they just call up. You just heard about this an hour before it was going to happen. That the president announced that uh, you've been invited. Yes, and then shortly thereafter they announced it was all going to be on TV. So I just want to know what I'm getting into before I get there. <laughs> well, here's what's going to happen when you get there. You're going to get your ass kicked, okay? Because you're so full of crap. Because you know that you have no intention of reaching out. You have no intention of being bipartisan. You have no intention of giving him a single vote. You have no intention of doing health care reform. When you were the majority leader, you didn't do health care reform. Uh, when your party was the majority in the House and in the Senate, you know, you, and Bush was the president, you never did it. You never even came close. The CBO rated their proposal because they came up with a proposal. Do you know that at the end of the decade, according to the Republican proposal, they would have 10 million people less insured. Do you understand that? You know, we have all these people that are uninsured. You have 10 million people, I should say, maybe a better way of saying this, 10 million people more that would be uninsured. That's the Republican proposal. He's like, well, well what do we need to insure those guys for? We don't make any money from them. And I love the way he's like, are the lobbyists coming? Because I don't, that's, I, if the lobbyists are coming, I'm going. <laughs> okay, but if they're not there, I don't know why I'm walking into this trap. Now, what J.R. did was he did a compilation of, uh, of all of the things that he said. Now, this is, nothing is repeated, okay? These are all things that he said just spliced together. Let's watch that. Really, what is this? So it's a stunt? Uh, well, I don't know. That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. Uh, I don't want to walk into some, some trap. I don't want to walk into some political event. You know, is this a, a political event or is this going to be a real conversation? Uh, I don't want to walk into... 
uh, to some setup. I don't know who's going to be there. I don't know how big the room's going to be. I don't know how, uh, what the setup's going to be. I just want to know what I'm getting into before I get there, uh, before, before we go down there and, and walk into who knows what. <laughs> oh, God. He's, he has goaded me to say the word. Remember that old song, OPP? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, you know what? It, it, it's not just Boehner, it's Cantor, too. Let's let this guy cry a little bit. Uh, let's go to clip number five. He's, of course, uh, also in the House Republican leadership, and he's also scared to death of this summit. Uh, the reason why I asked specifically about the May, when did, when did you start proposing that you do this, uh, this bipartisan meeting with the president is because, at least as I understand it, the president is, is not going to start all over. It's not going to start from scratch. And one of the things that you ask for in your letter to the president's chief of staff is that, is that you start all over and work together. It sounds like the president's got the House bill, the Senate bill, and that's going to be uh, your baseline. So now what happens? Well, again, we, we want to participate in the discussion and sure, certainly yeah. welcome the transparency for Obviously, once. Yes. Uh, but, you know, if, if the president and the speaker are wed to a government replacing of our health care system, we're not for that. They know we're not for that. And frankly, enough of the members on their side of the aisle are not for that either. So that is a non-starter. What we need to do is, in a bipartisan fashion, is focus on how we bring down costs. That's where this debate began almost a year ago, and that's where we need to go. And there are a lot of things we can do, such as put in place malpractice reform, such as put in place real competition so that people can have a choice, and there'll be a market to bring down costs the, about purchasing across state lines, and there are other solutions. But really, we need to go about focusing on cost reduction. That's where the debate needs to go. A pack of lies. <laughs> what government takeover? There's not even a public option in there. There's nothing in there about that. This is, if anything, since we're pushing 30 million new customers into private insurance, it's a corporate takeover. And that's why I'm scared to death of this bill. The bill, I think, is incredibly watered down. Uh, all the corporate lobbyists won off of it. I think the Democrats might be walking into a trap if they do this bill. Uh, but for him, Eric Kander, to claim that it's a government takeover of health care, what an unbelievable pack of lies. They're still going with that nonsense. All right, one last one, more nonsense. Eric Cannon, clip number six. And, of course, we're going to have our eyes on the Republicans to see whether or not it is, as the Democrats say, whether you uh, truly have been obstructionist or not. So uh, all, all eyes on both parties for this, sir. <laughs> Listen, Greta, you know, and we've spoken before, uh, the House Republicans have put a plan on the table. We voted on it uh, when the Democrat bill came to the floor. We have solutions. Those solutions yeah. have been validated by CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, to bring down health care premium a costs. Of lies. That's where we ought to be focusing because that will produce really a reform that people want. The premise of the Democrats' bills thus far has been expand existing government programs to a point where it's unsustainable because it imposes taxes on small businesses and imposes unfunded mandate and costs on states when they could afford it and least. Absolutely untrue in every way. As I told you earlier, the CBO said that there would be 10 million people more uninsured at, with their plan. They don't even, in their plan, they don't even get rid of pre-existing conditions or rescission. So what part of that is health care reform? They say, you know, we fit it, fit it on a page. I know you did, because there's nothing in it. <laughs> you say, ah, oh, basically, it's let's keep the system exactly as it is. But tort reform. <laughs> wow, wow, what a great plan. I let them buy across states. By the way, that stuff's already in the plan. Those things were accepted. We did a segment on that a couple of days ago. They had four proposals, all four, and they had more than four, to be fair. But four of their main proposals are already in the bill. So... All there, and I love, my favorite part of that clip was when Greta Van Susteren said, is, so are you trying to be obstructionist here, right? And he's like, <laughs> come on, who are you kidding around with? You're Fox News, you can't ask me questions like that. What are you, crazy? No, of course not, obstructionist, no, obviously not. All right, look, when we come back, I know this is a theme of mine, and I'm pounding it, right? Somebody's going to pound it on how uh, Obama is totally going the wrong direction on bipartisanship, right? Uh, but someone uh, picked up on that theme, and they have an excellent fact about the Bush administration, 
and what they did uh, or did not do with uh, bipartisanship and how they were successful. So I got to share that fact with you guys and there's some good news from Democratic leadership today. All right, Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. All right, finally, we get to do some entertainment and, uh, and pop culture stories. The schmoopy story I love. All right, first, let me thank some members real quick. I'm going to go to Colonel Umberto Castaneda. I love that. Umberto. Umberto Castaneda. <laughs> Colonel Castaneda, it's great to have you here. Uh, and random one, let's go with Todd, member number 383, Todd Hoitzma. Todd Hoitzma, uh, you rock the world because you joined up all the way back in 2007. She's in Lord and Mercy. It's a long time. Uh, all right, post game is here's what's happening. Okay, I'm throwing my dad under the bus. I'm telling a schmoopy story about Wendy. Okay, mm. in regards to this story, but I'm saving it for the post game because it's a little more personal, right? And then number three, oh, hate mail, awesome hate mail against me. So. Oh really? Yeah, oh, fantastic. I'm surprised you didn't forward that to me. Why would I forward that to you? Because you know it was fun. Oh. I mean, a lot of hate. So that's coming in the post game. Okay. So now let's get schmoopy. All right, let's do it. Uh, one of our listeners, Stephanie, sent me this article, and it was published in Women's Health, and I love it. All right? So, schmoopy talking. All right? What are the effects of schmoopy talking? The Journal of Social and Personal Relationships says that schmoopy talking and pet names make a stronger relationship, lead to a stronger relationship. The more uh, you give your significant other a pet name, the more likely your relationship is going to last longer and be stronger. All right, well, here is uh, a fairly well-known fact, very uh, poorly kept secret right. uh, in this studio, which is that although I, you know, I'm a little tough and I'm a little... <laughs> that inside, schmoopy, pop poopy. Okay, so I, I totally believe this. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm a big believer in it, and I believe in the cutesy little names. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know it's goofy. And I know it upsets other guys, okay? And that's why you got to be cool. You can't do it in public. A friend of mine sent an email the other day. He thought he was sending it to his wife. Turns out he was sending it to all of us by accident. Oh. And he's like, hey, bunny. Oh. We're like, oh, no. Oh. Hey, bunny. <laughs> <laughs> can't do it. Can't play with it. Can't win with it. Now, having said that, I think it's cute that he calls her butt. Right, right, okay. right. And it does make for a healthy relationship. T tell us why. Okay, uh, so what you want to do to have a healthy relationship is make sure that you have more positive communication uh, rather than negative communication, right? So uh, they broke it down. You need to have a 5 to 1 ratio of positive to negative communication in your relationship in order to be happy. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, it's not a hard and fast rule. There are other ways to be happy, right. but you're more likely to be. More likely, yes. Okay, if you go in that direction. 5 to 1, I'm crushing, man, with my schmoopy papoopy names. Oh, like 15 to 1, 20 to 1. And, you know, killing. the article also talks about how uh, couples need to have their own private culture, which means the more inside jokes you have, the more, um, you know, code words you guys have, the better. Mm -hmm. Because you have your own special little culture, your own special secret communication. That's what we do with the TYT audience. What are you talking about? You mm -hmm. know, when I to say Rodell, you know who I'm talking about, right? And you're like, oh yeah, Rodell with a horse, right? <laughs> Just like that, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but Rodell was not schmoopy. No. <laughs> All right, by the way, if you don't know that, I think we've updated the glossary, TYT glossary, on, mm -hmm. on theyoungturks.com. If you don't know any of the sayings, you could just go check it out, and you'll say, oh, da 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 ba da da I, now finally I know how to spell wasikt <laughs> Uh Okay, so that, that makes a ton of sense to me, too. Right. I, I would like to uh, take a moment here to get super random on the story. I like that one of the uh, scientists working on this, or researchers, his name is Turndorf. Okay, that dude needs a schmoopy name. Okay, because Turndorf sounds like something out of like Lord of the Rings. Oh, the Black Knight Turndorf. I remember when he lost to the White Wizard, Glandorf. So there was uh, also a researcher uh, with the last name Love, Pat Love. He's the co-author of How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. See, see I think they were mo motivated to do the research because of that. <laughs> like Turndorf's like, I need some other name, and, and like Love's obsessed with love, and that's why. He or she, it was, I don't know who, Matt, who was doing the research, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and then one other random note on the story is that they say, uh, or two, actually. One is that if you call someone uh, sweet names, that that's better uh, because it, it, it emphasizes how, you know, 
your feelings towards them in a more positive way. So peaches, honey bun, cupcake. It, it also means that you view them as a treat. Oh. Okay, this story, there's like <laughs> single guys all over the country and, and plenty of married guys who are vomiting all over their laptop as we speak. But, but they're all guilty of it, okay? Oh, totally. They're all guilty totally. of it. We vomited in, in, uh, in public and uh, in private. We're like, hey, my little cupcake. Okay, no, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. Okay. Uh, sometimes worse. Anyway, the last random part of it is apparently if you call someone by their real name or their full name if you've been doing the schmoopy names, like that is a sign that there's something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And it's funny because one of my girlfriends, if I ever called her a real name, she'd be like, what's wrong? Right? Mm -hmm. So she was onto this. She had this instinct. I was like, there's nothing wrong. I just called you by your name. She's like, no, I'm onto you. That's so funny. Right? And maybe she was right. I don't know. All right, Buttercup, what's next? <laughs> by the way, I, I have to share what my, uh, my pet name is because my pet name is messed up. Uh, yours for your boyfriend or no, your no, boyfriend's no. for you? My boyfriend's for me. Oh, here comes somebody under the bus. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm going to share it. He calls me number four, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why he calls me number four. Because he he's always made fun of my feet. He thinks my feet look funny. And he uh -huh. thinks that specifically the number four toe on my feet are really funny looking. So he always says, oh, look at number four. <laughs> Funny looking, deformed. <laughs> You're number four. <laughs> well, that's a little unfortunate, you know, because <laughs> you know, because in the article it talked about like, hey, if their names are unflat unflattering, like stinky, like that, that might be an issue, right? So number four is a bit of an issue, right? Right. The only thing that's redeeming about it is toes are a little cute, like mm -hmm. oh, cutie cutie toes, mm -hmm. number four. Da -da -da. Now I would tell you what I call Wendy, except I can't do it. I can't do it in public mm -hmm. because it's just too embarrassing. Are you doing it in the post game show? Come on, do it for our members. What are they paying for? All right, we'll do it in the post game show. Oh, all right. Uh, okay, all right. So, but I look, I, we're going to run over time here, but we got to, we got to. I got to do some of these stories. Okay. I, they're too much fun. You know, I really, really want to do the police officers video. Jesus, that was my cue. Uh, but <laughs> to get, but I want to give him some time to get that video, and we'll do the Alec Baldwin story. Yes. First, okay. So. Alec Baldwin was rushed to the hospital because his daughter Ireland called 911 and said that he threatened to uh, take pills and end it all. <laughs> and uh, when Alec Baldwin was told about this, he said, you thoughtless little pig. <laughs> oh, no, that was early. Uh, so anyway, they bring Alec Baldwin to the hospital, and they had to stay there for an hour, but it turns out he didn't take any pills. It, right. it was just uh, panic for no reason. But, you know, I like that the girl panicked a little bit. You know, cares about his, her dad. Their relationship appears to be a little better. So that's good. But, Alec, why are you even talking like that, man? I think this dude doesn't get that he's on top of the world. Yeah, he doesn't get it. He I doesn't mean, he get thinks it at all. He thinks he's a terrible actor. Remember, he wants to quit acting. He's crazy. Yeah, you're crazy, dog. You're crazy. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention the regular show because I didn't have much to say about it, but Bill Clinton also taken to the hospital today. I know. He had two stints put in his artery. Yeah. That's serious. And he's only 63. Do you know, know. he's had like growths removed from his skin, and you know he had heart surgery before. He's falling apart. Well, he grew up in Arkansas. He had a lot of corn dogs. Uh, you know, he, no, he, he he's famous for eating rather unhealthy. No, you know? I know, I know. I know, but then I'm in a lot of trouble. So uh, that relates to a story in the post game. Anyway, uh, yeah, well, we, of course we hope uh, Bill Clinton's better. And uh, well, we'll, AP says that he's in high spirits. High spirits. Well, <laughs> maybe more. Sarah Palin was there to lift his spirit. <laughs> yeah, betcha. <laughs> Could you imagine if they had an affair? <laughs> How awesome would that be? Okay, I'd love that story. I don't get political ramification. La, la 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 la. Who cares? That's just be like the greatest story of all time. <laughs> she saved the dress. She said, "Oh, this were Bill Clinton." <laughs> Anyway, right. uh, so let's do the bikini story, uh, police story. All right, so um, two police officers in Arizona have been accused of uh, sexually harassing a drunk woman. She was involved in a car accident, and for some reason or another, she was in her bikini. Okay, she wasn't wearing clothing. She was wearing a bikini. So uh, one of the police officers decided to molest her while the other one stood by and made sure no one saw anything. All right, so let's get a news report on it, and I, there's something about this news report that I love and then we'll come back and talk. Full glimpse at the stunning and salacious details that got two cops kicked off the force. They took advantage of a drunk woman who had just been in a traffic accident. CBS 5's Peter Bush has the story. A cop at a traffic stop
holds all the cards. Tonight we know exactly how these two Phoenix officers played their hand. Encountered a suspected drunk driver. This car. Woman's wearing a bikini. Double down. This gigantic internal investigation turned up a couple of guys who had poor judgment in spades. Michael Cruz and John Urban. They abused their power and took advantage of the woman. Drove her to a nearby elementary school. Cruz fondled her in his squad car in the parking lot. The woman later said, I was scared somewhat I would be raped. Urban had a chance to stop it. What is that? A blind eye. Next, the officers dropped the woman off at a nearby target. Here's newly released store surveillance video. The woman hugs Officer Cruz, then walks into the store wearing nothing but the bikini and a skimpy shirt and stole a dress. She said she was sorry she shoplifted, but she felt she had no choice. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the story is about two Phoenix police officers who went to a traffic stop holding all the cards and broke the public trust and threw away their careers. Police Chief Jack Harris gave Cruz and Urban a choice, quit or be fired. They both quit. The woman did not press criminal charges. Reporting live in Phoenix, Peter Bush. What was the cards in the middle of that story? What was <laughs> that about? And a stop sign in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> and they wouldn't stop, stop sign. <laughs> like, is he messing with us on purpose, or does he think that's clever? No, it, I mean, he made a very serious story look clownish. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then he wanted to double down and split the aces. <laughs> I mean, he's like, he threw every card analogy in there for no reason. Okay. But that's the thing. I mean, he thought he was being clever and being creative with his newscast or it was his, creative. his package or whatever. It was creative. <laughs> it was uh, terrible. And now, uh, on to the substance of the story. Um, so, how uh, classy is Cruz taking her to an elementary school to fondle her? I know, her? I know. Okay, super classy move. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, Cruz had enormous ears. <laughs> yes, I noticed. Like that dude, man, he, now he's not going to be able to get the money to do plastic surgery on his ears. <laughs> Okay, because he's out of a job. Um, and then why did she hug the officer? That was kind of weird, yeah. right, at the end. And so there was a lot of weird things going on in that story. And then he fondled her. Weird? What do you mean? Okay. Why is that weird? Okay, I'm just, I'm too much of an ass, so I'm going to leave it right there. Yes, JR. Um, I know what you're saying. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Please. She was fat. Oh, okay. Hey, Seuss. Oh. I denounce and reject oh. you. I condemn what you have said. Okay, <laughs> we're so terrible. Go ahead. No, but I, I understand the whole hugging thing. I mean, she's probably still afraid. Some police officer, she's like, I was drunk driving, and she's probably whatever. Oh, and all I that, see, all I that see. just went down, and she's like, I can get out of here. Who knows what they did to her exactly? I don't even want to know. But um, did you notice that she was walking to the Target with the surveillance? Um, because you know she only had the little shirt on. Someone was walking out, and he like stopped and was like. Oh, I didn't notice that. Totally like, oh, he was, it wasn't a checker outlook, but it was like, what the hell? But he was, uh, he stopped and turned around and was like, was like okay, <laughs> dude, it's a chick in a bikini. Calm down. Yeah, I don't know why everybody's so mental about her being in a bikini. Okay, I guess uh, it was it's summertime just, or something. I don't know. It's random. I hope it wasn't recently. If it was recently, that's weird. Okay, but, <laughs> but yeah, she's in a bikini. I don't know. I've got an. I'd car. probably stare at her. I'm not going to lie. I'd be like, that's kind of weird. She's barefoot. She's wearing a bikini. Yeah, I guess. Walking I mean, target. like, if a really hot chick walked in a bikini in a Target, I'd be like, oh, how you doing? Mm -hmm. And I'd have a great reason to stare because it's weird, right? And I'd be like, no, no, baby, I'm just staring because it's weird. Mm -hmm. So, but... Uh, You're so slick, Jake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's how I roll. All right, so that's that story. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Okay, now, uh, it, <laughs> there's a lot of Target and Walmart stories here. A lot of things going down in, in different places. Oh, you want to do Lady Gaga first? Let's do Lady Gaga first. Okay, this one's real simple. Right, she's in uh, New York for Fashion Week, all right, uh, and she's looking clownish as ever. Mm -hmm. right? She put uh, pearls all over her face. I think this is probably the scariest look that she's ever had because, first of all, she has super white makeup on, right, and it makes her teeth look so amazingly stained and yellow. Mmm, that's a good point. I hadn't noticed that. Oh, yeah. it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, so it makes her look more ghoulish. Yes. It makes her look like she's a cousin of Mitch McConnell. Um, so I hear you on that. Um, gluing the pearls to your face is obviously slightly strange. 
uh, to say the least. But, you know, at this point, I'm kind of used to it with Lady Gaga. This is kind of right. what I expected. So I thought, it's about time. Because, you know, we'd gone about four days without a wacky outfit. But you so want, you want to know I'm enjoying something. it now. I'm, I'm there for the ride. You also have to think about the fact that she stood there and had someone glue every pearl on her body one by one so she could oh. achieve that look. Yeah, that's, that's what disaster. sounds painful. That's true. And her a hat there looks like a, like a wedding cake. It, it almost looks delicious. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, I almost wanted to eat her hat. <laughs> Jared Jackson, let me ask you the most random question of all time. Would you have sex with Lady Gaga? No. No? No. Huh, interesting. Hey, Susan, I'm assuming you're a yes. Because uh, just because, you know, my... Yes, uh, I, I know Jesus. I, I'm a thrill seeker, man. <laughs> I would try this out. Okay, my question, though, is would you have sex with her while she was in the Pearl outfit? Yeah, I'd try it out. <laughs> it, it'd be interesting. He's the most open-minded man in America. <laughs> oh, yeah, very open-minded. How about the, the remember the crazy uh, bird's nest thing? That, that, uh, that aspect is the only thing that would interest me, actually, because then she's really boring without all that, actually. Okay, so you're like, oh, you recovered in pearls then? Then we're having a conversation. Then this is something worth at least looking at. Okay, but this outfit, like a lot of people would find a little sexy, actually, right? She had that outfit, okay. <laughs> okay, she goes, hey, hey, it's cool, it's cool. L let me give you a little mouth love. <laughs> but she's wearing that. Uh, yes or no? What would Jesus do? draw the line uh, on the pearls why would I draw the line here because that scares me I feel like something wrong is gonna happen to you know downstairs yeah. when if she you know if she approached like that's gonna that's stab me in thrill, some way man. that's part of the thrill okay <laughs> you're a thrill seeker man you're a ghost you're a ghost writer I don't know what that means but okay yeah <laughs> all right we have a clear answer all right final story for you here and then uh, we will do a shitstorm of porn right okay uh, in the post game show as well and then uh, the tech sexting, we probably will do the sexting. Well, I would promise too many stories. Just calm down. Find out what happens in the post game. All right, last story here. All right. A 23-year-old man by the name of Wesley Strellis uh, was at a Walmart in Atlanta, and he just randomly took a baseball bat and decided to bash uh, 29 flat-screen TVs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the video. It's the surveillance video. Uh, and he's going to work on these fuckers, right? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You like your flat screen? Here's what I like about your flat screen. Okay. So, now, why do we do this story? One, and then I love the way he throws away the bat. Like, he's cool. He's Robert De Niro in, uh, in uh, well, Untouchables. Look at all the people watching him. And then I, yeah, and all the people gathered, like, shit, dude, dude, this dude's fucked up. <laughs> Should we say something? And they're like, nah. <laughs> They're just watching. They're like, that's cool, that's cool. We call the cops. Everything's going to be all right. This dude's going to get so tased when the cops show up. <laughs> but as it turns out, he was mellow by the time they came. He was chill. And he just put out his hands like, okay, go ahead and cuff me. Yeah. And so he knew what was going down. What do we have, some depression issues here? Yeah, I mean, when the cops showed up, they found antidepressants in his pocket. He probably forgot to take his pills. I mean, this is a pretty sad story. This guy lost it. Yeah. Uh, here's what apparently did not work. The antidepressants. <laughs> okay, that was Effexor XR. Uh, I'm just throwing it out there. I, you know, <laughs> might not don't, have been. Don't use it. It's not effective. <laughs> well, it wasn't effective for that guy. Right. Um, okay, here's what I have to really say about the story. Come on, it's a little cool. Okay, he's in a lot of trouble. He owes like tw twenty-two thousand dollars now. Twenty-nine counts of criminal damage to property. But who hasn't wanted to go to into a store and go house with a bat? Like, I, don't do it. That's crazy, right? But come on, all of us guys, we have like this, you know, weird, masculine... Are you not entertained? Not that one. Now seat belt, look down. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we want to, like... Oh, take there. That'd be kind of fun, right? All right, that's me. Let's let me... First, as a girl, any fun in that or no? None. Yeah, you'd be surprised, yeah. I mean, there are moments when you feel aggression and you want to... You want an outlet. You want to find something to do to get that aggression out. So, yeah, I could totally imagine doing that. Right? In a fit of rage. This is Sparta! Come on, who do I want to do that? Uh, hey, Susan, I don't even have to ask you. You're definitely going to want to do it. Uh, so JR is the only guy who might not want to do it because he's too chill, he's too cool, he's too jazz, smooth jazz. Damn. <laughs> okay, so what? Go ahead. No. You don't want to do it, right? 
I, yeah, I, I knew it. I, I, right. I, 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 I think a step ahead. I'm like, well, do I really want to deal with this shit? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm giving you a free pass. I'm giving you a free pass, okay? I bought the TVs. No, some dude we don't know, and he's like, I bought him just so JR can go house up. Just imagine the TMZ cameraman right in front of you. Right. Now, if I was that type of person, it was easy. I was thinking about punting his camera across the street. I I'm going to get medieval on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, but do you do you smash the TVs? No, it doesn't do anything for me. I don't I'm know. telling you, I don't know, smooth. And the thing is, no, I, I get mad too, but I I don't know. I, I really, if I did that, I'd feel worse afterwards. I'd be mad that I did that. Yeah, it's crazy. Duh. That I'm that no, fucking stupid it. to do. It. I'm like, oh, you fucking idiot. That's yeah. all I'd say. You know, not, then I then I'd be mad enough to do something like that. Okay, in the post game, I'm gonna tell you about crazy shit we used to smash when I was in college. <laughs> the post game is loaded for bear. I, we're never going to get out of here. It's going to take 45 minutes, minimum. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, so let's go to the post game. We'll see you there, Young Turks.